Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Jamie, Pandora, and Bella. As always, I remind you to please stay safe, healthy, hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, and hit the notification bell. So today we're getting back into Stephen King's fairy tale. We are on chapter 18, the second part, and then we're going to be on category 3. And without further ado, let's get there. back to part three of chapter 18. <clears throat> the sundial filled the part of the alcove with the V of the two wings and narrowed before it was assigned on an on an iron pole. Let me get my water. Faded but still legible, it said, all keep out. The disc looked to be 20 feet in diameter, which made it, if my math was right, but 60 feet in circumference. I saw Mr. Borch's initials on the far side. I wanted a good look at them. They had guided me here now that I was. Now that I was, those last ones might tell me the right direction to turn the sundial. It wasn't possible to ride Claudia's three-wheeler across because the sundial's circle was rimmed with short black and white pickets of about three feet high. Radar coughed, choked, and coughed some more. She was panting and shivering up. One gummed eye shut. One eye gummed shut. The other looked at me. Her fur was matted against her body, letting me see. Not that I wanted to. <coughs> How pitiful, pitifully thin she'd become, almost skeletal. I just eaten that from my cats. I dismounted the trike and lifted her out of the basket. Her shivering against me was convulsive, shuddering. Relax, shuddering and relax. Soon, girl, soon. Hoping I was right because this was her only chance and it had worked for Mr. Bodichad in it, but even after the giant and the mermaid, I found it hard to believe. I stepped over the pickets and walked across the sundial. It was stone and divided into 14 pie wedges. Now I think I know how long the days are here, I thought. A symbol, simple symbol worn, but still recognizable, was engraved in the center of each wedge. The two moons, the sun, a fish, a, a bird, a pig, an ox, a butterfly, a bee, a sheaf of wheat, a bundle of ber berries, a drop of water in a tree, a naked man and a naked woman who was pregnant. Symbols of life, and as I passed beside the high pole in the center, I could hear the click, 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 click of the eyes in the sun's face as they went back and forth, ticking time away. I stepped over the short pickets on the far side, still holding radar against me. Her tongue hung limply from the side of her mouth as she coughed relentlessly. Her time had grown short indeed. I faced the sundial and Mr. Bodich's initials. The crossbar of the A had been turned into a slightly curved arrow pointing to the right, which meant that when I turned the sundial, if I could, I think this is the only, <laughs> I'm really curious to see what happens, it would be moving counterclockwise. That seemed correct. I hope so. If it was wrong, I would have come all this way. Just kill my dog by making her even older. I heard whispering voices and paid them no mind. Radar was all out thinking about just her and I knew what had to be done. I bent and gently laid her on the wedge engraved with a sheaf of wheat. She tried to raise her head but couldn't. She laid it sideways on the stone between her paws looking at me with her one good eye. Now she was too weak to cough and could only wheeze. Let this be right and God please let it work. I knelt and grasped one of the short rods ringing the sundial's circumference. I pulled on it with one hand and both. Nothing happened. Radar was now making choking sounds between gasps for air. Her side went up and down like bellows. I pulled harder, nothing. I thought of football practice and how i been the only one on the team not just able to pull, move the tackling dummy but to knock it over. Pull, you son of a gun. Pull for her life. I gave it everything I had. Legs, back arms, shoulders. I could feel blood rushing up my straining neck and into my head. I was supposed to be quiet in Lillimar, but I couldn't restrain a low growling grunt of effort. Had Mr. Bodich been able to do this, I didn't see how. Just when I thought I was still wasn't going to be able to budget, I felt the first minuscule shift to the right. I couldn't possibly pull harder, but somehow I did every muscle in my arms, back and neck standing out. The sundial began to move instead of being directly in front of me. My dog was now a little to my left, right. I shifted my weight the other way and started pushing for all I was worth. I thought of Claudia telling me to 
strain my pooper. I was straining it now for sure. Probably on the verge of turning the poor thing inside out. Once I had it started, the wheel turned more easily. The first picket was beyond me, so I grabbed another, shifted my weight again, and pulled on it as hard as I could. When that one slipped past, I grabbed yet another, made me think of the play merry-go-round in Cavanaugh Park and how Bertie and I used to spin it until the little kids riding on it were screaming in joy and terror and their mothers were yelling at us to stop before one of them flew off. Radar was a third of the way around, then half, then on her way back to me. The sundial was spinning easily now. Perhaps some ancient grease clog in the machinery beneath it had been broken, but I kept yanking on those pickers. Okay. Now going hand over hand as if climbing a rope. I thought I was seeing a change on in radar, but believed it might be only wishful thinking until the sundial brought her all the way back to me. Both of her eyes were open. She was coughing, but the horrible wheezing had stopped, and her head was up. The sundial moved faster, and I quit pulling at the pickets. I watched radar on her second circuit, and I saw her trying to rise on her front paws. Her ears were up instead of flopping dispiritedly. I squatted, breathing hard, my shirt damp against my chest and sides, trying to figure out how many... Turns would be enough. I realized I still didn't know how old she was. Fourteen, maybe even fifteen. If each circuit equaled a year, four years on the sundial would be good. With turns in the sundial would be good. Six would put her back in the prime of, her, of life. When she passed me, I saw she wasn't just propping herself up on her front legs. She was sitting up. And she came as she came around for the third time, I saw something I could hardly credit. Rage was filling up, putting on weight. She wasn't yet the dog who had scared the crap out of Andy Shen, but she was getting there. Only one thing bothered me, even without me yanking on the short posts. The sundial was still picking up speed. The fourth time around, I thought Radar looked worried. The fifth time, she looked scared, and the wind of her passage blew the sweat-soaked hair off my forehead. I had to get her off. If I didn't, I'd be treated to the sight of my dog becoming a puppy. To the sight of my dog becoming a puppy, and then nothing. Overhead, the click, click, click. Well, the sun faces eyes had become click, 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 and I knew that if I looked up, I'd see its eyes going left and right faster and faster until they were just a blur. Amazing things can go through your mind in times of, times of extreme stress. I flashed on a Turner Classic Movies Western I'd seen with my dad back in his drinking days. Pony Express, it was called. What I remembered was Charlton Heston galloping hellful other toward a lonely outpost where a bag of Mail hung on a hook. Charlton snatched it without ever slowing his horse from its all-out gallop, and I was going to have to snatch Radar the same way. I didn't want to shout, so I got into a crouch and held my arms out, hoping she'd understand. When the sundial came around and she saw me, she got to her feet. The wind of the speeding disc rippled her fur like invisible stroking hands, and Mr. Charlton Heston hadn't missed the mailbag, but that was a movie. I'd have to jump on myself, grab her, and jump off. I might lose one of my 17 years in the process, but sometimes desperate measures are the only measures. As it happened, I didn't have to grab her at all. When I put her on the sundial, Rage could have walked, couldn't have walked on her own. After five going on six turns on it, she was an entirely different dog. She dropped to her haunches, flexed new powerful back legs, and leapt into my outstretched stretched arms. It was like being hit with a flying bag of concrete fell over on my back with radar over me, four paws planted, planted wide on either side of my shoulders, wagging her tail like crazy and licking my face. Stop it, I whispered, but the command didn't have much force because I was laughing. She went on looking. At last, I sat up, took a good look at her. She had been down to 60 pounds, maybe less. Now she had to go 90 or 80 or 90. The wheezing and coughing were gone. The room drying on her snout was also gone as if it had never been there. The white had disappeared both from her snout and the black saddle of fur on her back. Her tail, which had been a tattered flag, was bushy and full as it swished back and forth. Best of all, the surest indicator of the change the sundial had wrought were her eyes. It was no, there were no longer, they were no longer filming in daisy, days, as if she didn't know exactly what was going on within her, in her or in the outside world around her. Look at you, I whispered. I had to wipe my eyes. Just look at you. Part 4, Chapter 18. <laughs> Makes me happy. 
I hugged her, then stood up. The thought of finding the gold pellets never crossed my mind. I'd tempted fate enough for one day, more than enough. There was no way this new and improved version of radar would fit in the basket on the back of the three-wheeler. One look was enough to convince me of that, nor did I have her leash. That was back at Claudia's house in Dora's cart. I think part of me must have believed I'd never need such a thing again. I bent, put my hands on the sides of her face and looked into her dark brown eyes. Stay with me and be quiet, hush raids. We went back the way we came, me pedaling, radar paddling along beside me. I made it a point not to look in the pool. As we neared the stone passageway, the rain began again. Halfway along the passage, I stopped and dismounted the trike. I told radar to sit and stay. Moving slowly, keeping my back to the passageway's moss coated side, I slid to the end. Radar watched, but didn't move. Good dog. I stopped when I could see the golden arm of that grotesquely overdecorated throne. I took another step, praying my Neck and saw it was empty. Rain pattered down on the striped canopy. Where was Hannah? Which side of the two-part house? And what was she doing? Questions for which I had no answer. She might still be eating her midday meal of stuff that smelled like pork, but probably wasn't. Or well, she might have already gone back to the living quarters for her afternoon nap. I didn't think we'd be gone long enough for me to assume she'd finished eating, but that was only a guess. The last little while, first the mermaid, then the sundial, had been intense. From where I stood, I could see the dry fountain dead ahead. It would just get, it would give us a good cover, but only if we were unobserved until we got there. Just 50 yards, but when I imagined the consequences of being caught out in the open, it seemed a lot further. I listened for Hannah's bellowing voice, louder even than Claudia's, and didn't hear it. A few verses of the pronged dong song would have come in handy for pinpointing her location, but here's something I learned in the haunted city of Lillimar. Giants never sing when you want them to. Nevertheless, a choice had to be made, and mine was to try for the fountain. I went back to Radar and was about to mount up on the trike when there was a loud slam to the left of the passageway's end. Radar started and turned that way, a low snarl beginning deep in her chest. I grabbed her before it could morph into a volley of barks and bent down. Quiet, Radar, hush. I heard Hannah muttering something I didn't, couldn't make out, and there was another of those great ripping farts. This one didn't make me feel like laughing because she was walking slowly across the entrance to the passageway. If she looked to her right radar and I could stand against the wall and maybe in the dimness go unobserved, but even if Hannah were nearsighted, Claudia's three-wheeler was too big to miss. I drew Mr. Bowditch's revolver and held it to my side. She turned our way. I was going to shoot her, and I knew exactly what I was going to aim for. That red-rimmed crack running down the center of her forehead. I'd never practiced with Mr. Bowditch's piece or any piece, but my eyes were good. <sighs> Shoot, man. I might miss the first time, but I'd have four more chances even if I didn't. As for the noise, I thought of those bones scattered around the throne and thought, F the noise. She never looked our way or toward the fountain either, only stared at her feet and went on muttering in a way that reminded me of Dad before he had to make a speech of the... Overland National Insurance Annual Dinner when he was, when he won Regional Employee of the Year. There's something in her left hand, but her hip mostly blocked it until she raised it to her mouth. She was gone from sight before she could bite into it, which is fine by me. I'm pretty sure it was a foot. And that there was already a crescent-shaped bite in one side, below the ankle. I was afraid she might settle back onto the throne to polish off her after-lunch treat, but apparently the rain, even with the canopy to shield her, just Courage that idea, or maybe she just wanted her nap. Either way, there was the slam of another door, this one towers. Right, then silence. I holstered the piece and sat down next to my dog. Even in the dimness, I could see how good Radar looked, how young and strong. I was glad. Maybe that seems like a tame word to you, but it doesn't to me. I think gladness is a big, big deal. I couldn't keep my hands off her fur and marveling at how dense it was. Part 5, Chapter 18. I didn't want to wait till I wanted... All I wanted was to get the hell out of Lillamar with my renewed dog and take her into that supply shed and supply shed and watch her eat as much as she could. I was betting that would be a lot. I'd give her a whole jar of origin if she wanted and a couple of perky jerky sticks to top it off. Then we would watch the monarchs return to their roosting places. That was what I wanted, but I made myself wait and give Hannah a chance to settle down. I counted the 500 by 10s, then 5s. Then twos, I didn't know if that was time enough for that the oversized witch to get into full snooze mode, but I couldn't wait any longer. Getting out of her vicinity was important. 
But he also had to be out of the dark, out of the city by dark, not just because of the night soldiers. Some of Mr. Bodich's marks were very faded. If I lost his trail, I'd be in bad trouble. Come on, I told Raider. But hush, girl. Hush. I pulled the tri trike, wanting to have it behind me. If Hannah suddenly emerged and attacked while she was swiping out of, it out of the way, I might have time to draw and fire. Plus, there was Radar, who was back to her, fa her fighting weight. I had an idea that if Hannah messed with rage, she was going to lose some flesh. That, I thought, would be a pleasant sight to see. Seeing Hannah break Radar's neck with one swipe of her enormous hand, however, wouldn't be pleasant at all. I paused at the, mo at the mouth of the passageway, then started for the mountain with, with a radar beside me. There was games, particularly against our chief rival, St. John's, that never seemed to end, but the walk in the open between Hannah's house and the dry fountain in the square were the longest fifty yards of my life. I kept expecting to hear some Ampasirian version of fee fi fo fum and hear the ground shake and thud <coughs> of her running feet as she came after us. A, big, a bird squalled, maybe a crow, maybe a buzzard, but that was the only sound. We made it to the fountain and leaned against it to wipe and make sure of sweat and rainwater from my face. Rado was looking up at me. No shaking or shivering now. No coughing either. She was grinning, having no adventure. Having an adventure, that is. I took another look for Hannah, then mounted up and started pedaling for the fancy divided boulevard where once upon a time the elite folks had no doubt met to eat tea sandwiches and discuss the latest qu gossip. Maybe in the evenings there had been ampicerian barbecues or lamplit cotillions in big backyards that were now overgrown with weeds, thistles, and dangerous flowers. I went at a pretty good clip, but Radar kept up easily, loping along with her tongue flying jauntily from one side of her mouth. The rain was coming down harder, but I barely noticed. All I wanted was to retrace my course and get out of the city. I'd worry about drying up off then, and if I caught a cold, I'm sure Claudia would stuff me for a little chicken soup before I headed back. Before, before I headed back to Woody's, then Dora's, then home, my father would give me a whole wrap of crap, but then when he saw when he saw Radar, he'd, he'd walk. I decided not to worry about that now. First job was to get out of this unpleasant city, which was, wasn't deserted at all, which wouldn't quite stay still. Part 6 of Chapter 18. It should have been easy. Simply follow Mr. Bodge's marks in reverse, going in the opposite direction of each pointing arrow until we get back to the main gate. But when I came to the point where we'd entered the wide boulevard, his initials were gone. I was sure <coughs> excuse me, they'd been on a cobblestone in front of a sparkling building with a dirty glass cupola on top. But there wasn't a sign of them. Could the rain have washed them away? Didn't seem likely, considering all the rain that must have fallen on them over the years, and this set had still been relatively bright. More likely, I'd been wrong. I pedaled further down the road, boulevard looking for A.B. at the passing three more street signs with no sign of them. I turned around and went back to the ba bankish-looking building with a cupola. I know it was here, I said, and pointed down the crooked street to where an earthen pot containing a dead tree let lay over it turned in the street. I remember that. I guess the rain washed away the marks after all. Come on, Raids. I pedaled slowly along, eyes peeled for the next set of initials, feeling uneasy. Because they were a chain, weren't they? Sort of like the chain that had been that led from my mother's fatal accident on the frickin' bridge to Mr. Bowditch's shed. One link was gone, broken, there was a good chance I'd be lost. You would still be wandering in that hellhole at nightfall, Claudia said. Further down this it narrow street, we came to a lane of ancient deserted shops. I believed we'd come that way, but there was no initials here either, I thought. I recognized what could have been an apothecary on one side, but the slumped, vacant-eyed building on the other didn't lo look familiar at all. I looked around for the palace, hoping to nail down our location that way, but it was barely visible in the sheeting rain. Radar, I said, and pointed to the corner. Do you smell anything? She went in the direction I pointed and snipped at the crumbling sidewalk then looked up at me, waiting for further instructions. I had none to give, and I certainly didn't blame her. We'd come on the three wheel wrapped the wall, and even if we'd been walking, the downpour would have washed away any remaining scent. Come on, I said. We went down the street because I thought I'd remember the apothecary, but also because we had to go somewhere. I thought the best place would be to keep sighting on the palace and try to work my way back to Galleon Road, using the main thoroughfare. 
might be dangerous. The way Mr. Borch's signs had skirted around it suggested as much, but it would lead us out. As I said, it was a straight shot. The problem was that the streets seemed to insist on taking us away from the palace rather than toward it. Even when the rain slacked off and I could see those three spires again, they always seemed farther away. The palace was on our left, and I found plenty of streets leading in that direction, but they always seemed to, end, to dead end or bend back to the right again. The whispering was louder. I wanted to dismiss it as the wind and couldn't. There was no wind, a building with two stories seeming to grow a third in the corner of my eye. But when I looked back, there was only two. A square building seemed to bulge out toward me. A gargoyle, something like a griffin, seemed to turn its head to watch us. If Radar saw or sensed any of this, it didn't seem to bother her. Maybe she was just reveling in her strength, but it bothered me plenty. It was harder and harder not to think of Lillimar as having a, as a, a, of Lillimar as a living entity, semi-sentient, and determined not to let us go. The street ahead of us ended in a steep, slided gulch full of rubble and standing water, another dead end. On impulse, I turned down an alley the narrow, so narrow that the trike's back wheels scraped rusty flakes from the brick wall sides. Radar walked ahead of me. Suddenly, she stopped and began barking. They were loud and strong, f powered by healthy lungs. What is it? She walked. She barked again and sat, ears cocked, looking down the alley into the rain, and then from around the corner of the street to which the uh, alley connected, sorry, came a high voice I recognized at once. Hello, savior of insects. Are you still an irritable boy, or are you now a scared boy? One who wants to run home to mommy but can't find his way. This was followed by a squall of laughter. I cleaned away your marks with lie, didn't I? Let's see if you can find your way out of the lily before the no, nope, night soldiers come out to play. No problem with me. This little fellow knows these streets like the back of his hand. It was Peterkin. But in my mind's eye, I saw Christopher Polly. Polly, at least, had a reason to want revenge. I'd broken his hands. What, I'd done, what had I done to Peterkin besides make him stop torturing an oversized dread cricket? Embarrassed him, that was what. It was all I could think of. <coughs> But I knew something he almost certainly didn't. The dying dog he'd seen on Kingdom Road wasn't the dog I was traveling with now. Radar was looking back at me. I pointed down the alley. Get him! <laughs> she didn't need to be told twice. I was one of the German Shepherd. Trained to prick my cats. Rage sprinted toward the sound of that unpleasant voice. Splashing up brick tinged water from her paws and darted across the, around the corner. There was a surprise shriek from Peterkin and a volley of barking, the kind that scared the heck out of Andy Chen once upon a time, and then a howl of pain. You'll be sorry, Peterkin screamed. You and your flippin' dog. I'll get you, my pretty, I thought, as I pedaled down the narrow alley. I wasn't able to go as fast as I wanted to because the hubs of the back wheels kept scraping the sides. I'll get you and your little dog, you. <laughs> Someday I'll do all the I'll front bombs. Hold him, I shouted. Hold him, Radar. If she could do that, he could lead us out of here. I would persuade him just as I persuaded Polly. But as I was nearing the end of that alley, Radar came back around the corner. Dogs can look shame-faced. Anyone who's ever lived with one knows that, and that's how she looked just then. Peter can have gotten away, but not unscathed. In her jaws, Radar held a good-sized scrap of bright green cloth that could only have come from Peter Kin's britches. Even better, I saw two spots of blood. I reached the end of the alley, looked to my right, and saw him clinging to the second-story cornice of a stone building 20 or 30 yards down the street. He looked like a human fly. I could see the metal gutter he must have climbed to get out of Radar's reach, but not quite quickly enough. Ha ha. As I watched, he scrambled onto a ledge and squatted there. It looked crumbly, and I hoped it would give way beneath, but no such luck. It might have done. Have done it if he'd been of an ordinary size. You'll pay for that, he screamed, shaking a, a fist at me. That The night soldiers will start by killing your lippin' dog. I hope they don't kill you. I want to watch Red Molly rip your guts from your belly in the fair one. I drew the piece, but before I could shoot at him, give, given the distance, I would almost certainly have missed. He gave another of his ugly screams, tumbled backward into a window with his little arms, clasping his little knees to his little chest, and was gone. Well, I said to Radar, 
that was exciting, wasn't it? What do you say we get the hell out of here? Radar about barked once and dropped that piece of his pants before it poisoned you, Radar did, and he went on as we passed the window through which Peter Gunn had disappeared. I kept an eye over him, hoping he'd appear like a target in a shooting gallery, but no luck on that either. I guess cowardly Fs like him don't give you a second chance, but sometimes if the fates are kind, you get a third one. I could hope for that. It's the end of chapter 18. We are on to chapter 19. Okay, chapter 19. The Trouble with Dogs, The Pedestal, The Graveyard, The Outer Gate, Part 1. Trouble with Dogs, supposing you don't beat or kick them, of course, you better not, is they trust you. You're the food giver and shelter provider. You're the one that can fish the squeaky monkey out from beneath the couch with one of your clever five-fingered paws. You're also the love giver. The problem with that kind of unquestioning trust is that it carries a weight of responsibility. Mostly that's okay. In our current situation, it was anything but. Radar was clearly having the time of her life, practically bouncing along beside me, and why not? She was no longer the half old, half-blind German shepherd. I'd had to haul first in Dora's car and then in the basket. Find Claudia's oversized trike. She was young again. She was strong again. She'd even had the chance to rip up the seat of a nasty old dwarf's pants. She was easy in her body and easy in her mind as well. She was with the food giver, the shelter provider, the love giver. All was awesome sauce in her world. I, on the other hand, was struggling against panic. <sighs> if you've ever been lost in a big city, you'll know. Except there, here there was no friendly stranger I could ask for directions. And here the city itself turned against me. One street led to another. But each new street led only to dead ends where gargoyles leered down from great blind buildings I'd swear hadn't been there when I'd turned around to check for Petergan slinking along and I'll wake. The rain slackened in a drizzle to a drizzle, but my view of the palace was often blocked by buildings that seemed to grow that moment. I looked away, cutting off the view, and there was something worse. When I saw it, when I, when I was able to glimpse the palace, it always seemed to be in a different place than the one I was expecting, as if it were moving, too. That could have been a fear-driven illusion. I told myself it, so again and again, but I didn't completely believe it. The afternoon was passing, and every wrong turn reminded me that dark was approaching. The fact was simple and stark, thanks to Peterkin. I had entirely lost my bearings. I almost expected to come upon a candy house where a witch would invite me and my dog, me, Hansel, her, Gretel, inside. Meanwhile, Radar kept pace with the three wheel, looking up at me with a doggy grin that almost shouted, Aren't we having fun? Oh, oh, we went on, we went and on. Every now and then I got a clear view of the sky ahead and I stepped upon the three wheeler's seat in an effort to glimpse the city wall, which had to be the biggest thing in the landscape, except for the three spires of the palace. I couldn't see it, and, I, and those spires were now on my right, which seemed impossible. Surely if I'd crossed... Oh, get some Doritos in my book. Bugs me. Surely if I'd crossed in front of the palace, I would have eh, cut the galleon road, and I hadn't. I felt like screaming. I felt like curling up on a ball with my hands around my head. I wanted to find... A policeman, which is what, what my mother told me my children were supposed to do. My mother told me children were supposed to do if they got lost. And all the time, Radar was grinning up at me. Isn't this great? Isn't it just the coolest ever? A we're in trouble, girl. I paddled on. No patch of blue in the sky now, and certainly no sun to guide me. Only buildings crowding in, some smashed, some merely vacant, all somehow hungry. The only sound was that faint, dull whispering. If it had been constant, I might have been able to get used to it, but it wasn't. It came in bursts, as if as if I were passing congregations of the unseen dead. That terrible afternoon, I can never convey to you how terrible it seemed to go on forever, but at last I began to sense the first draining toward Evening. I think I cried a little, but I can't remember for sure if I did. I think it was much for Radar as for myself. I had brought her all this way, and I would accomplished what I would come for. But in the end, it was all going to be not for nothing, because of the gosh darn dwarf. I wished Radar had ripped her it out his throat, because 
said of the seat of his hands. Worst of all was the trust I saw in Radar's eyes every time she looked up at me. You trusted a fool, I thought. Worst luck for you, honey. Part 2 of Chapter 19. We came to an overgrown park, surrounded on three sides by gray buildings, stacked with empty balconies. <coughs> they looked to me like a, crisp, like a cross between the expensive condos lining Chicago's Gold Coast and prison cell blocks. In the center of it was a piece of huge statuary on a high pedestal. It appeared to be a man and a woman flanking an enormous butterfly, but like all the other works of art I'd encountered in Lillimar, not to mention the poor murdered mermaid it had been mostly destroyed. The head and one wing of the butterfly had been pulverized. The other wing had survived, and based on the way it had been carved, all color was gone. Actually, the man and woman might have been a king and a queen in days of yore, but there was no way to tell because both of them were gone from the knees up. As I sat looking at this vandalized tableau, the three bells rang out across the haunted city, each peal spaced out and solemn. You don't need to be through the gates when, the, when three bells ring, Claudia had said, but you must be out of Lillimar soon after, before dark. Dark would be soon. I started to pedal on, knowing it would be fruitless, knowing I was caught in the spite of what Peter Kinn had called the lily, wondering what fresh horror the night soldiers would bring when they came for us. And then I stopped, struck by a sudden idea that it was simultaneous was simultaneously wild and perfectly reasonable. I did a U-turn and returned to the park. I turned to dismount the trike, considered the height of the pedestal that ruined tableau stood on, and changed my mind. I paddled into the high grass, hoping there was there were none of those nasty yellow flowers to give me a burn. I also hoped the three-wheeler wouldn't get bogged down because the ground was mushy from all the rain. I put my back, back into it and kept paddling. Radar stayed with me, not walking or even running, but leaping along, even in my current situation. That was wonderful to see. The statuary tableau was surrounded by standing water. I parked in it, hung my pack over the handlebars, stood on the seat of the trike, and reached up. By rising on my toes, I could just get my fingers over the gritty edge of the pedestal. Thank God that I was still in fairly good shape. I did a chin up, got first our forearm, and then the other on a surface that was littered with, some, with stone chips and scrambled the rest of the way. I had one bad moment when I thought I was going to tip over backward, landing on the trike and probably breaking something, but I gave one final lunge and grabbed the stone woman's foot. I got a couple of good belly scratches from the rubble as I pulled myself the rest of the way, but sustained no real damage. Radar was looking up at me and barking. I told her to hush, and she did. She kept wagging her tail, though. Isn't it wonderful? Look how high he is. I got up and grasped the raining wing of the butterfly. Maybe there was a little magic left in it, the good kind, because I felt some of my fear subside, holding it first with one hand and then the other. I did a slow 360-degree turn. I saw the three spires of the palace against the darkening sky, and now they were roughly where what remained of my sense of direction told me they should be. I couldn't see the city wall and hadn't really expected to. The pedestal I stood on was high, but too many buildings were in the way. Purposely, I'm almost sure. I was almost sure. Wait, Radar, I said. This won't take long. I hoped I was right about that. I bent down and picked up a piece of stone with a sharp point and held it loosely in my fist. Time ticked by. I counted the 500 by <coughs> tens, then by fives, and it lost count. Excuse <sighs> me. Most calm. I was too concerned with the dark in the sky. I could almost feel it draining away like blood from a bad cut. At last, just when I began to believe I'd climbed up here for nothing, I saw darkness rise and what I decided to call the south. It came toward me. The monarchs were returning for the night. I held my arm out, pointing it like a rifle toward the oncoming butterflies. I lost sight of the cloud when I knelt down again, but continued to hold my arm out straight. I used the point of the shard I'd picked up to scratch a point on the side of the to, to scratch a mark on the side of the pedestal, then sighted along my outstretched hand at a gap between two buildings on the far side of the park. It was a start. Assuming the gap didn't disappear, that was. I pip pivoted on my knees and slid my legs over my, the edge. My plan was to hold on until I was dangling from the side of the pedestal. But my hand slipped and I fell. Radar gave a single bark of alarm. I knew enough to let my knees flex and to roll when I landed. The ground was soft from the rain, which was good. I got splashed from head to toe, 
with mud and water, which wasn't, which was, which wasn't. And I got up, almost falling over my eager dog when I did wipe my face and look for my mark. I pointed my head along it and was relieved to see the gap between the two buildings was still there. The buildings wood or not stone were diagonally across the park. I saw standing water in places and knew the three-wheeler would get bogged down for sure if I tried to ride it. I was going to owe Claudia an apology for leaving it behind, but I'd worry about that when I saw her if I did. Come on, girl, I slung my pack and began to run. Part 3 of Chapter 19 We splashed through the wide puddles of standing water. Some were shallow, but in places the water was almost up to my knees, and I could feel the mud trying to suck the sneakers from my feet. Radar kept pace easily, tongue flying, eyes bright. Her fur was soaked and matted her newly muscular body, but she didn't seem to mind. <clears throat> we were having an adventure. <clears throat> the buildings looked to me like warehouses. We reached them, and I stopped long enough to resettle and retie one of my sopping sneakers. I looked back at the pedestal. I could no longer make out my mark. The ruined tableau was at least a hundred yards behind us, but I knew where it was. I pointed with both arms back and ahead, then ran between the buildings with the radar right beside me. They'd been warehouses, all right. I could smell the ancient ghost aroma of the fish that had been stored in them long ago. My pack bounced and jounced. We came out in a narrow lane lined with uh, more wa warehouses. They all looked as if they'd been broken into, probably looted long ago. The pair directly across from us were too close together to slip between, so I went right, found an alley, and ran through it. On the far side was, was someone's overgrown garden. I jinked to the left back to what I hoped was my former straight line and ran on. I tried to tell myself it wasn't twilight, not yet, not yet, but it was, of course it was. Again and again I had to devour, I had to detour around buildings that were in our way, and again, again I tried to regain the straight course to where I'd seen the butterflies. I was no longer sure I was doing that, but I had to try. It was all I had. We passed between two great stone houses, the gap so narrow I had to sidle, radar no such problem. I came out into my right in a walkway between what might once have been a grand museum and a glass-sided conservatory. I saw the city wall reared, about the, it reared above the buildings on the far side of the street. The clouds so low in the gathering gloom that the top was lost. Radar, come on! The, that gloom made it impossible to know if real dark had come or not, but I was terribly afraid it had. We ran down the street we'd come out on, not the right one, but close to the galleon road. I felt sure of it. Ahead of us, the buildings gave way to a cemetery in the far side of the street. It was full of leaning gravestones, memorial tablets, and several buildings that had to be crypts. It was the last place I wanted to venture into after dark. But if I was right, God, please let me be right, I prayed. That was the way we had to go. I sprinted through tall iron gates, standing ajar, and for the first time, radar hesitated. Front paws on a crumbling concrete slab. Rear paws on the, in the street. I stopped too long enough to catch my breath. I don't like it either, girl, but we have to. So come on. She came. We wove uh, out around the leaning grave markers. An evening mist was beginning to rise from the overgrown grass and thistles. I could see a wrought iron fence 40 yards away, 40 yards ahead. It looked too high to climb even if I hadn't had my dog with me, but there was a gate. I tripped over a gravestone and went sprawling. I started to get up then froze, at first not believing what I was seeing. Radar was barking wildly, a desiccated hand with yellowing bones showing through. Torn skin emerged from the ground. It opened and closed, clutching and releasing little showers of wet earth. When I saw, saw such things in horror movies, I just laughed and hooted along my friends and grabbed more popcorn. I wasn't laughing now. I screamed and the hand heard me. It turned toward me like an effing radar dish. Clutching at the darkening sky, I leapt to my feet and ran. Rage ran beside me, barking and snarling and looking back over her shoulder. I reached the cemetery gate. It was locked. I drew back, lowered one shoulder, and hit it the way I'd heard I'd hit I'd once hit an opposing lineman. It rattled but didn't give. Radar's barks were climbing the ladder the ladder no longer roof, 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 but yark, 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 almost as if she were all also trying to scream. I looked back and saw more hands emerging from the ground like ghastly flowers with fingers instead of petals, first just a few, then dozens, maybe hundreds. Something else, something worse, a squall of rusty hinges. The crypts were about to give up their dead, I remember thinking that 
punishing trespassers was one thing, understandable, but this was ridiculous. I hit the gate again, hit the gate again, giving it something, everything I had, the lock broke, the gate burst open, and I went flailing toward, forward, arms waving, trying to keep my balance. I almost made it, then tripped over something else, maybe a curbstone, and then went to my knees. <coughs> Excuse me. I looked up and saw that I'd fallen into the galleon road. I got to my feet, knees stinging and pants ripped. I looked behind me into the graveyard. There was nothing coming after us, but those waving hands were quite bad enough. I thought about the strength it would talk to. It, I mean, it would take to burst open coffin lids and cloth with the intervening earth. First, for all I knew, the Empisarians didn't bother with coffins. Maybe they just wrapped their dead in shrouds and called it good. The ground mist had taken on a blue glow as if electrified. Run, I shouted at Radar. Run. We ran for the gate. We ran for our lives. Part 4 of Chapter 19. We'd come out on the road much further up from where we'd turned off to, fellow, off to follow Mr. Borges' marks, but I could see the outer gate in the gathering gloom. It might have been half a mile ahead, maybe a little less. I was gasping, and my legs felt heavy. Some of that was because my pants had gotten soaked with mud and water when I fell from the pedestal, but mostly it was simple exhaustion. I had played sports for my entire scholastic career, but I had skipped basketball, not just because I didn't really care for Coach Harkness, but because given my size and weight, running really wasn't my thing. There was a reason I played first during... I played first during baseball season, it was the defensive position requiring the least speed. I had to slow to a jog, even though the gate didn't seem to be getting any closer. It was the best I could do if I wanted to cramp up and get have to stop. If I didn't want to cramp up and have to stop. Then Radar looked over her shoulder and began giving those high, frightened barks again. I turned and saw a flock of brilliant blue lights coming toward us from the direction of the palace. It had to be the night soldiers. I didn't waste time trying to convince myself otherwise. Just picked up my pace again. We bre my breath ran in and out of me, each gasp and blow hotter than the last. My heart was thundering. Bright spots began to pulse in front of my eyes, expanding and contracting. I looked back again and saw the blue lights were closer, and they had gained and they had gained legs. They were men, each surmounted, surrounded by a fierce blue aura. I couldn't see their faces yet and didn't want to. I stumbled over my own stupid feet, caught my balance, ran on, full dark had arrived, but the gate was a lighter shade of gray than the wall, and I could see it was a closer. If I could keep running, I thought we'd had, we had a chance. A stitch started in my side, not bad at first, then sinking in. I ran up my rib cage and drilled into my armpit. My heart, ha hair wet and muddy, flopped up and down on my forehead. My pack thudded against my back, so much blast, I slipped it off and slung it into a nest of brambles beside a turreted building flanked by posts, striped red and white, and topped with stone butterflies. Those monarchs were still whole, probably because they were too high to uh, reach without ladders. I stumbled again this time over a snarl of uh, downed trolley wires, t caught myself again, and ran on. They were closing in. I thought I thought about Mr. Borch's piece, but even if I, it worked against these apparitions, there were too many of them. Then a wonderful thing happened all at once. My lungs seemed deeper and the stitch in my side disappeared. I'd never done enough extended running to experience a second wind, but it had happened to me a few times on times long times on long bike rides. I knew it wouldn't last long, but it didn't have to. The gate was now only a hundred yards ahead. I risked one more glance over my shoulder and saw that the shining troop of night soldiers had stopped gaining. I faced forward and put on even more speed, head thrown back, hands clenched and pumping, breathing deeper than ever. For 30 yards or so, I even pulled the ra head of radar. Then she caught up again and looked over at me. No big. Isn't this fun grin on her chops now? Her ears were flat against her skull and white rings showed around her brown eyes. She looked terrified. At last, the gate. I pulled in one last deep breath and screamed, Open in the name of Lee of the galleon. The ancient machinery under the gate screeched into life, then smoothed out to a deep rumble, the gate trembled and began to slide open on its hidden track, but slowly, too slowly, I was afraid. Could the night soldiers leave the city? We slipped through. I had an idea they couldn't. That their fierce blue wars would wink out and they'd crumble away or melt like the wicked witch of the west. An inch, too. I could see a tiny sliver of the outside world where there were wolves, but no shining blue men and no rotted 
hands coming out of graveyard earth. I looked back and really saw them for the first time, twenty or more men with maroon lips, the color of dried blood, and parchment pale faces. They were dressed in loose pants and shirts that looked weirdly like army fatigues. That blue light was gushing from their eyes, spilling downward, coating them. They had features like ordinary men, but they were gauzy. I could glimpse the skulls beneath. They were sprinting at us, leaving little splashes of blue light behind them that dimmed and faded out, but I didn't think they were going to make it in time. It was going to be very close, but I thought we were going to escape. Three inches, four. God, it was too slow. Then came the sound of an old-fashioned fire bell. Clang-a-lang-a-lang, and the cadre of blue skeleton men parted ten or a dozen to the left, and the rest to the right. Speeding up the galleon road came an electric vehicle like a jumbo golf cart or a squat open airbus in front moving some sort of deeding, or excuse me, steering stick to and fro was a man, I used the word advisedly, with graying hair falling to either side of his hideous half-transparent face. He was gaunt and tall. Others were crammed in behind him. Their blue auras overlapping and dripping down to the wet pavement like strange blood. The driver was aiming right at me, meaning to crush me against the gate. I wasn't going to make it after all, but my dog could. Radar, go to Claudia. She moved only looked up at me in terror. Go, Rage. For goodness sake, go, go. I had dumped my pack because its sudden weight was slowing me down. Mr. Bowditch's piece was different. I couldn't shoot enough night soldiers with it to keep them from getting to me, and I had no intention of letting them have it. I unbuckled the holster belt with its decorative conchos and slung it into the darkness. If they wanted the, the piece, they'd have to leave the walled city to look for it. Then I slapped Radar's hindquarters in a heart. Blue light washed over me. I know you can resign yourself to death, because in, the, in that moment I did. Go to Claudia. Go to Dora. Just go. She gave me one final wounded look. I'll never forget it. And then slipped through the widening gap. Something hit me hard enough to drive me against the still moving gate, but not hard enough to smash me against it. Saw the gray-haired night soldier's lunge over a steering stick. I saw his outstretched hands, the finger bones visible through the tallow of his glowing skin. I saw the eternal grin of his teeth and jaw. I saw blue streams of some awful reanimating power gushing from his eyes. The gate was open enough for me now. I dipped away from the thing's clutching fingers and rolled toward the opening. For a moment I saw Radar standing in the darkness at the end of Kingdom Road, looking back, hoping I lunged toward her, one hand outstretched, and those terrible fingers Closed around my throat. No, Kitty, the undead knight soldier whispered. No, hold one. You've come to the lily uninvited, and here you will stay. It leaned close, a grinning skull beneath a stretched gauze of pale skin. A walking skeleton. The others began to close in. One shouted a word. I thought it was Elamar, a combination of Empus and Lilamar, but now I know better. The gate began to close. The dead, hand tightened. Cutting off my air, go red or go and be safe, I thought, then knew no more. And that's the end of chapter 19. Well, I can read a little bit of chapter 20. Chapter 20, Durant's Vile Hamey, Feeding Time the Lord High Interrogation, Part 1. Radar fights the urge to turn back to the new master, to return to the gate and jump up her front paw scratching her fantry. She doesn't do it. She has her orders and runs. She feels like she can run all night, but she won't have to because there's a safe place if she can get in. Slap, slap. She lopes on and on, body low to the ground. There's no moonlight, not yet. And no wolves howl, but she feels them near. If there's moonlight, they will tap. They will attack. And she senses moonlight coming. If it does, and they do, she will fight. They may overwhelm her, but she will fight to the end. Slap, slap. Wake up, kitty. The moon slid out of an unraveling cloud, the smaller in its eternal chase of the larger in the first wolf, wolf howls. But there ahead is the red wagon in the shelter where she and Charlie spent the night when she was still sick. And if she can reach it, she can slip inside if the door is still open. She thinks she didn't close it all the way. He didn't close it all the way, but he is, but isn't sure. That was so long ago. If it if it is, she can stand on her back legs and push it closed with her paws. If it isn't, she will put her back against it and fight until she can fight no more. Slap, slap. Do you want to miss another meal? Nah, nah. The door is open. A jar. Radar pushes through it and slap. Part 2 of Chapter 20. 
the one finally shattered the one finally shattered the dream I'd been having and I opened my eyes to a chancy shadowy light and someone kneeling over me her hair straggled down his hair straggled down to his shoulders and he was so pale for a moment I thought it was the night soldier who'd been driving the little electric bus but I, I sat up fast a bolt of pain was went through my head I followed by a wave of dizziness I raised my fists the man's eyes widened and he drew back and he was a man not a pallid thing surrounded by an envelope of blue light that spilled from its eyes. These eyes were hollow and bruised look looking, but they were human eyes, and his hair was a dark brown that was almost black, not gray. Let him die, Hamie, someone shouted. She's flipping 31. They'll never go for 64. Those, day those days are gone. One more and we are for it. Hamie, if that was his name, looked toward the voice. as He grinned. Showed, showing white teeth and a dirty face, he looked like a lonesome weasel, just trying to bedirk my eye, I, my soul, I. Too good to us another, you know, too close to the end, not to think about the ever after. F yourself and F <coughs> your ever after, said the one called I. <coughs> There's this world and the <coughs> fireworks, and that's all. I was on cold, damp stone over Hamie's scrawny shoulder. I could see a wall of blocks oozing water where they... Barred window high up, nothing between the bars but black. I was in a cell, Durant's vial, I thought. I didn't know where the that phrase came from. Wasn't even sure I know what I knew what it meant. What I knew was that my head ached terribly, and the man who'd been slapping me awake had breath so bad it was like some small animal died in his mouth. Oh, and it seemed I'd wet my pants. Hamie leaned close to me. I tried to draw back, but there were more bars behind me. You look so you look strong, kid kitty. Amy's stubble ringed, mouth tickled against my ear. It was horrible and somehow pathetic. Will you burdeck the like I burdecked you? I tried to ask where I was, but all that came out were cracked pieces of sound. I licked my lips. They were dry and swollen and thirsty. That I can fix. He scurried to a bucket in the corner of what I now had no doubt was a cell, and Amy was my cellmate. He was wearing ragged pants that stopped at his shins like a castaway in a magazine cartoon. His shirt was barely a singlet. His bare arms glimmered in the chancy light. They were pitifully thin, but they didn't look gray. In the bad light, it was hard to tell for sure. You flippin' idiot. This was someone else, not the one Hamie had called I. Why make it worse? Did your nurse drop you on your head when you were... when you was a babbin? The kitty was barely breathing. You could... you could have sat on his chest and made an end to him. Back to thirty, slick as spit. Hammy paid no mind. He took a thin tin cup from a shelf over what I assumed was his palate and dipped it in the bucket. He brought it to me with one finger, sturdy as the rest of him, pressed against the bottom. Hole in it, he said. I didn't care because cause it wasn't going to get a chance to leak very much. I snatched it and gulped it down. There was grit in it, but I didn't care about that either. It was heaven. Gross. Something him while you're at it. Why don't you? Another voice asked. Give him a good old you-know-what. We won't go into that. Hames, that'll bring him around. Smart as a pony whip. Where am I? Hammy leaned forward again, wanting to be confidential. I poured his breath. It was making my head ache even worse, but I stood it because I had to know. Now that I was coming around a little and leaving my wishful dream of radar behind, I was surprised I wasn't dead. Malini whispered, Deep Malene 10, something, some word I didn't know below the palace. Twenty, I shouted, and you'll never see the sun again, new boy. None of us will, so get used to it. I took the cup from Hamie and made my way across the cell, feeling like radar at her oldest and weakest. I pulled it, I filled it, pulled my finger over the water trickling from the small hole in the bottom and drank again. The boy who was one who once watched Turner Classic movies and ordered online from Amazon was in a dungeon. No way to mistake it for anything else. Cells ran along both sides of a dank corridor. Gas lamps protruded from the walls between a few of the cells. Muttering bluish li yellow light, water dripped down from the huge rock ceiling. There was puddles in the central passage across from me. A big fellow wearing what looked like the remains of a long, long underwear bottom saw me looking at him and jumped up on the bars, shaking them and making monkey noises. His chest was bare, wide, and hairy. His face was broad, broad. His forehead was low. 
he was ugly as F. But there was none of that creeping just figurement I'd seen on my way with this way to this charming abode, and his voice was all present and accounted for. Welcome, new boy, it was I, which I found out later was short for Iota. Welcome to hell. When the fair wind comes, if it comes, I believe I'll rip your liver out and wear it for a hat. First round, you. Second round, whoever they send against me. Until then, have a pleasant stay. Down the corridor near an iron banded wooden door at the end, another prisoner, this one female, yelled, You should have stayed in the citadel, kitty. Then lower, and you so should I. Starving would have been better. Amy walked to the corner of the cell opposite the water bucket, dropping dropped his pants and swatted over a hole in the floor. I got the bads. Might have been field mushrooms. What a year, and more since you... At any. I asked. You got the bads all right, but the mushrooms got nothing to do with it. I closed my eyes. And we're going to stop there. Oh, a little bit longer. Uh, in the next video, we will be getting back into chapter 20. Part 3 of chapter 20. And I hope you enjoyed this video. Please be sure to hit that like button, subscribe, comment below. Hit the notification bell. You stay safe and healthy. You stay cool. And you have a great day.